so yeah good evening uh, everybody uh, thank you so much for joining the ask me anything session uh, with the immigrant project and as you guys know our speaker for today is yashmanian who is uh, from the field of robotics so uh, this is not like a lecture or a one way delivery session it's a very interactive session where you can literally ask him anything on how to build a career in robotics uh, before we dive into uh, yash's profile uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, who we are uh, as an organization what we do what our mission is uh so we call the immigrant project and our mission is to empower uh, new immigrants to find their first professional jobs in the united states and how we do that is by providing effective tools and meaningful connections um we have all uh, three uh, four broad categories of product offerings which is called the show and tell which is very domain specific deep dive uh, ask me anything which we are doing today with yash and then we have job hacks uh, which is uh, for resume building and interactive uh, behavioral interviews on those lines and then uh, we are experimenting with something called as the master class which is for uh, with speakers uh, who have been uh, who are on the leadership or executive levels so that's like our team which is growing by the day so we have today on the call uh, i'm one of the co-founders uh, i'm based uh, i work for amazon uh, in seattle we have apurva reddy who is the other co-founder from the world bank and we have brahmi who is going to be co-facilitating with me the session today bhargavi who is a senior data engineer at netflix and she is also on the call today so uh the agenda for today's session is pretty straightforward uh, we'll be introducing the speaker uh we will be taking questions uh, which the response uh, we've gathered uh from event bright and also some live questions and then we would uh, yash um, has uh, going to be providing some resume live resume critique to participants who've sent their resumes to us in advance and who are on the call today so a little bit about yash manian he is also a fellow umd terp and uh, he currently works at computer as a computer vision engineer at iron robotics which is a startup in pittsburgh uh, he got interested uh, from, he participated in a lot of these robotics competitions back in india he was he leaded his college uh, team at robocon india and landed the sixth uh, national position he was also part of the sae baha and fsae supra teams uh, the formula racing teams as a design um, a participant and he pursued a masters in robotics from the university of maryland college park so um so he's from the class of 2018 and um, yeah that's about the introduction and uh, over to you yash um am i taking questions or hi uh, i will be facilitating uh, the questions for the evening i'm okay. thanks to be for the introduction um we got a lot of questions from the attendees um yash over the last couple of days and it's mm -hmm. pretty interesting uh that um the division of questions is roughly around how do i think about starting a journey in robotics what do what skills do i acquire and then how do I, how do i crack jobs let's start from uh the first segment which is for someone who has just finished their undergrad or for mm -hmm. someone who is considering their masters in robotics right what skills do you think um that they should look to gain over their course or what what should they consider before pursuing uh, a masters or a higher degree in robotics i have two very different answers to that so say i'll answer the first one uh when you've just finished your undergrad i'm assuming it's got, you were interested in robotics before and you chose one of the you didn't choose something like civil engineering which has no relation to robotics uh so as an undergrad i would either say if you're in india india doesn't really have a huge robotics industry you can still probably get a job at a um, startup like gray orange i don't know if they qualify as a startup anymore but that is something you should take a look at gray orange is a good place some of my colleagues and people that went to umd come from there they do a lot of uh, mobile autonomous robots they, there is also but then assuming you want to do more cutting edge work in robotics and you decide to do a masters uh you would either go to and for you know uh clarity because that's the path i follow i'm going to consider 
uh, the US. Uh, coming to the US, one of the first things I learned during my master's degree is robotics is a multidisciplinary field. I knew that already, but coming from India, my idea was, oh, I can, um, you know, do the mechanical design, the electronics design, um, write algorithms all by myself, which is if you want to do a robot that solves any worthwhile real world problem is you not know, a one person job. So you need to start narrowing your focus. And I imagine that's the purpose a master's degree serves. Um, during my master's degree, I chose to go work for professors in the labs so I could, um, you know, get exposure to research. And because of that, give me one second. All right. So I worked at Sarah Bergbrighter's lab, which is the micro robotics lab. And as a result of that, I found out I don't really like micro robotics. And then I switched to computer vision. So effectively, what you'll be doing during your master's is narrowing down your uh, perspective to what field of robotics you want to enter. Because people assume robotics is so niche, you can't divide it any further. Uh, tr uh, truth can't be further from that. So that would be my answer. Interesting. So, which um, you know, you you brought up um, the point on country, right? You said assuming the U.S. Do you have an insight into colleges in the U.S. are good to gain skills mm. um, in robotics? So, uh, when I started out, I looked for universities that specifically offered a robotics degree, which is why I ended up at Maryland and got a robotics degree. But during my time at Maryland, I found out that a master's degree and robotics is less about the school you're going to and more about the kind of professor you're working for, for example, or uh, what kind of research you're pursuing. So you could end up at the mechanical department at um, CU Boulder, but you could be doing, uh, I don't know, airfoil research for, um, you know, compliant um, wing, wing strain sensors, which is what Sarah was uh, my professor, not my professor, the professor I worked for, she was collaborating with a professor at CU Boulder with for. The gist is, you should be able to, if you, coming out of undergrad, if you know what specific field of robotics you want to be in, that's great, your uh, job is cut out for you. Right. But if you don't, uh, you can do what I did, go for a robotics program. Uh, some of the schools are WPI, Maryland is one, um, CMU is definitely one, but it's also the most difficult one to get into. You have um, Oregon State has a robotics program, and some of these have both masters in robotics and a PhD in robotics, depending on what your uh, what you want your trajectory to look like. So those are some of the schools I looked at. I applied to all of them. I only got into a couple. Okay. Uh, I chose Maryland. No. And I wish my reason was more, uh, you know, research oriented, but I chose it because it was cheaper. Sure. So when, uh, when you, when you got into Maryland and you started acquiring all these skills, right? Mm -hmm. When, and then when you were trying to apply for jobs, how did you go about identifying, you know, what skills you need and for those jobs and for what industries, I guess? Okay. So this again, heavily depends on what specialization you chose. Mm -hmm. so if you're a mechanical engineer who wants to go into robot design, the set of skills you would need are very different from a computer vision engineer. And um, there is one skill I believe all of anyone attempting to go into robotics should have, but I'll come to that later. So I speak for computer vision. It's basically you're trying to deploy computer vision solutions onto things that actually move. So power is a restriction, computing power is a restriction. Uh, you can't take too long to come up with your answers to whatever equations you're solving on the computer. So you need to be able to write it, write fast code. Only viable alternative right now in the industry is C++. Uh, people use Python, but that uh, personally in my company, we only mostly use it for prototyping and writing something quickly. C++ is a must. Uh, then depending on the kind of specialization you want to go to, say you're going for planning, uh, you need to be able to 
you need to understand the mechanics and the math behind something like an A star or a B star or an RRT and understand where you would choose which one. Uh, if you want to go for computer vision, depend again, depending on the kind of uh, specialization you're aiming for, if you want a more deep learning based approach, uh, those are the kind of classes you'd have to take. If like me, you want to go for a more um, classical approach, you would have to take, uh, you know, you'd have to understand the math behind um, linear algebra, uh, structure, uh, you'd have to understand computer vision techniques like structure from motion, camera calibration, projected geometry, perspective transforms, and so on. And uh, most roboticists in the software area, I would recommend they read the book Probabilistic Robotics. Uh, it covers most, it provides a basic foundation to general probabilistic filters you might need uh, to actually make sense of noisy data coming from sensors. Because remember, this is the real world then. There's a lot of noise and you don't actually have deterministic readings that you can base your understanding of the world on. So you would be needing some sort of probabilistic filtering knowledge there. So when you, um, you, you actually went into my next question mm -hmm. <laughs> there. So I, when you were applying for IM Robotics, right? Um, you already listed down sort of mm -hmm. the skills that were very important. What is that one skill that you just mentioned? That oh, yes. Uh, I, I made a big deal of it and never revisited it. Let me get to it. <laughs> uh, the most underrated thing which uh, people don't talk about, mm -hmm. and uh, I've seen a lot of people sort of ignore it, is communication. And by that, I don't mean just be a team player. Uh, what I mean is you're going to be interfacing with engineers of different disciplines. Uh, let me give you an example. For example, um, say our robots are working in a really hot facility and all of a sudden we start seeing, we have this point cloud projected from the computer vision system and it starts warping. Now you understand that temperature affects the camera because you understand the physics behind it, but then what's the solution? Academia doesn't really, um, info, uh, doesn't really do a lot of cross-cultural multidisciplinary research. It's more in depth in one area but when you're in the industry, you kind of need to talk to different people about it. So you need to be able to convey your ideas to say a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer to say, I have a thermal problem. Um, this is what I think is causing it. And then you have to understand how well their solution is going to help you in your software domain. If they say, oh, I'm going to add a heat sink to it and that's going to improve the airflow. I'm not saying you actually need to know the thermal equations to design the heat sink, but sure. I'm saying, it is important to know what a heat sink is and what you, uh, what the system you're working with generally is going to, uh, how it's going to be affected by outside forces and how it's going to affect the world sure. in a so, multidisciplinary way. So, so basically what you're saying uh, to sum it up is that um, many people tend to focus on mm -hmm. developing um, technical skills and completely mm -hmm. overlook the importance of being able to communicate the same in a very efficient mm -hmm. manner should you need to be considered for a role at mm -hmm. a company? Because that, like you said, is a very team dynamic. Um, you know, very contrary to how some people perceive that, oh, it's a robot, I'm just gonna sit and like make the robot. It's not mm -hmm. that, there's more. Great, awesome. I'll just take a pause here real quick. Um, uh, for, for, for folks on the call, uh, please feel free to put in your questions in the chat so that we can pick your questions and start asking them as well. Uh, the conversation will keep going on with the questions that I have, but I'm going to just, you know, use these questions that you put in. Also, if you want to voice out and ask the question yourself, more than uh, welcome to do so as well. Okay. With that, I will go ahead and pick one question in the chat that we have from Aditya. Uh, while interviewing, what were the technical rounds like? Was it more focused on lead code style coding rounds or more on your knowledge of computer vision? Um, I asked the question, Aditya, you're on the call. You can have a dialogue with uh, Yash real quick as well, if that helps. Okay. My answer to that question is yes. Uh, <laughs> to <laughs> uh, specify, uh, basically go into that, Yes, I had a lot of uh, coding interviews, lead code style questions, which I don't really like. They, I, that's, my, that's my own personal bias, but I won't get into that. 
uh, people want to know you can write C++ or you can write code and they want to know you can you understand data structures like hash maps, you understand what a linked list is, you want, they understand how to use pointers, how to construct classes, how inheritance works. There are other ways of doing that, but most people just go for the deep code style questions. Uh, computer vision wise, I was actually interviewed by the people on the computer vision team. And then they would more often than not just ask me to talk through my experience, to know what I had done. And then when they had specific questions, they would ask those uh, and they would be pointed questions. For example, if I was showing something like monocular visual, uh, the same orometry, they would ask me, oh, so when you're uh, when you're actually estimating the pose, how do you account for non-linearities based on the features you're observing? Because the camera is non-linear. And uh, if you had a solution for that, which you implemented, you can talk about that. If you didn't, most times I've found it, it's just best to say you don't know. If you lie and they catch you, it comes off much worse. Sure. What, what skills uh, you think are of most value um, Given, given the current trends that are there in the industry, right? What oh, first, I need to ask Aditya, did that answer your question? Oh, he, he replied, he said thanks. Oh. Yeah, he okay. did. All right. Yeah, thanks Aditya. Yeah, so what, what trends are the, what trends do you think are super important to watch out in the industry? And what skills do you think one should acquire for those trends um, in, in this particular industry? Um, I don't quite understand the question. When you say trends, you mean in the larger industry, for example? Say no, in your, or... in your, um, in just, in, in just your workspace, like for example, oh. you're oh, okay. in e-commerce, mm -hmm. um, disruption, right? Robotics is disrupting e-commerce. Sure. So what are the trends in that and what type of skills should one acquire in order to be able to get into such an industry? Depends on the company again. So when you have smaller startups, they don't have a fully formed solution. So they will need people with more, with more hardcore, less specialized skills. So they will need people who understand the math, they know how to write code, they understand how to architect it, and then they'll bring those people in. The further and further the company grows into its maturity, the product is also more stable. So then more specialized roles are formed. So then you can have uh, you can have a special you know a, a, a dedicated data scientist. You can have a dedicated uh, controls person. And uh, given that, if you look at the current cutting edge of research, and you look at what's in the industry right now, there is of course a bit of a gap because it takes a while for you to take what's coming out there, see if that's a viable solution to your problem and then um, you know, construct it into, you know, go through all the steps of product development to actually get it out there. So right now, if you're looking at autonomous mobile robots, things like localization, SLAM are important, uh, especially if the robot is uh, you know, moving around in an unstructured environment. Um, for those on the call who don't know what SLAM is, it means simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, basically, that's when the robot is taking info from the census and moving at the same time while constructing its own world and figuring out where it is in that world. So during, uh, you have SLAM, you have people like path planning. I do not know if companies are employing any fancy planning techniques out there. Um, to my understanding, they expect a general understanding of uh, Dijkstra, A star, RRT, and why you would choose between them and which one is best for you. Computer vision wise, like I said, a lot of people are either going the deep learning route, in which mm -hmm. case that's not my specialty and I will not talk a lot about it, or they're going the classical vision route where they're using traditional linear algebra, they're using optimization techniques, they're using feature extraction uh, to do that. So in that case, you would be better off reading some, uh, you know, going to something like multiple view geometry and the concepts they have listed there, they expect you to know how to calibrate a camera. If you have a stereo camera, how do you get the extrinsic transformations? How do you get the intrinsics from them? A lot of places just use something like OpenCV, or they would use something like ROS to communicate between their different nodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of places don't. It's good to have those skills. It's good to know 
uh, good to know how to use OpenCV, but it's also good to know how to, good to know the underlying math and how to actually implement those programs bare metal for yourself if you want to uh, use sure. them effectively. So how how does one um, gain these skills? Some of these skills while they're trying to approach a job or while they're trying to approach an industry. Um, I understand the whole masters and gaining knowledge in the masters, but then um, wh when you tend to get into the job search mode, it gets now very specific, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you need to acquire a specific skill for the role. How do you, wh what suggestions do you have for people in general? Build your own project. There's a ton of data sets out there you can use. Uh, for controls and more embedded level stuff, I don't really know. That's a hard problem because you require the hardware to test it out on. Right. Maybe there might be simulators out there which you can use, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm not too certain. For myself, what I can say is for computer vision, I after graduating, I had a bit of a I had a bit of a tough time finding a job because I had basically switched fields. I was doing micro robotics research for my final year, but then I wanted to do computer vision instead. So I had no valid experience apart from the classes I had taken. So I decided to build my own monocular visual odometry solution. So I downloaded the data set from Kitty, uh, which is the Karlsruhe Institute of something, something, I don't remember anymore. Uh, they have a great data set, which is basically a camera on a car driving through, I don't remember the city either, somewhere in Germany. And you can take that and run your own computer vision algorithms on them and you can benchmark it on, on their site. So you can test for how accurate your solution was, how quickly you were able to come up with it, and then you'll be ranked on the leaderboards. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. I use that to then build my uh, project. And as I was building it, I got interviewed by Am Robotics. I didn't get to finish it. Oh. And because I showed them the incomplete project I had and they liked that, so they hired me. But in general, if you can do that, you're learning skills along the way. Because I imagine when someone's applying to jobs, they're not just waiting around for interviews, they'll be solving lead code questions like Aditya asked, because those are annoyingly frequent in coding, uh, you know, these interviews. They would be asking you questions regarding your own specific coursework and research, which you need to brush up on. So I imagine there's a lot of preparation going on, which people are already doing. So if you want to learn something new or if you want to master an old concept, just, uh, I would suggest build a project. That's, um, that's, that's a brilliant um, advice. And one that, one that we actually see quite a bit on our sessions, right? When, mm -hmm. Whenever people say, hey, uh, I'm trying to apply for this job and the speaker goes, just make your own project or build mm -hmm. the skill on your own. And um, for folks on the call, I hope you're taking down notes on some of these uh, suggestions that he's, you know, giving us in terms of the resources or the links and names. I know it's a lot, uh, but try to try to try to take some down with that. One thing um, I would say is building a project also gives you a demonstrable that you can show people. Hmm. So it's a demonstration of the skill you've attained, and the better it performs, the better it shows your understanding of it. Now, when they ask questions, of course, if you've built it yourself, you have all the answers. So it's a win-win situation. It's wonderful. Um, we have one question from uh, Chayim. Mm -hmm. um, what was your game plan while applying to the robotics companies? Did you follow any specific routine? Um, you know, how did you reach out to the recruiter? The tactics, I guess. And we have uh -huh. Chayim on the call. So, hey, Chayim, if you want to have the conversation, go for it. Okay, so to answer that question, I will say I was terrible at networking, so I never actively reached out to recruiters who I thought might be in the field. What I did instead was I started narrowing down my job profile. Mm -hmm. So I think I had multiple versions of resumes for, for example, if someone, I, at that point, I wanted a computer vision uh, role, which was doing something like localization and mapping, but I wasn't frowning on a controls role either, so I had different control CV, and I was I would talk about the project. I would I only listed projects that were relevant to that, and then over time I would shot I would sort of take away from these or add to them, and then see which ones work. And the way I knew they worked is I started getting more calls. I also had access to UMD had this. I don't know if other universities had this, but UMD released 
a list of companies that we could apply to, which were startups in robotics, or they were already established companies which had a leaning towards robotics and who had positions available. A lot of them were done. They didn't have the position available or anymore, or they never applied. But a lot of, I, I went through the list and then I would go through 10 a week with one set of resumes and then find out which ones actually worked, how many calls did I get back. Not a great metric uh, because I don't really have any control for what the right uh, keywords they were looking for are, but that was the only one I had available, so I used it. Sure. Um, I hope that answers the question. And Cheyenne says that he's happy with the answer. Oh, cool. Good. Uh, all right. Um, how how do you suggest one? Uh, how do you suggest um, a person to keep up with these up and coming trends in in the robotics industry at large? Do you have some journals that you follow, some pages that you follow, some newsletters that you follow? Is is, is there something that we could suggest to the audience? Um, I would say keep in touch with the friends you make in grad school. I, those are your best source. Apart from that, for research, I would say uh, we have at work, we have a journal club. So every so often, one of us would select a journal they like, uh, and then we would go through it, all of us as a group. So all of us stay up to date with current research. Mm -hmm. Some of uh, journals, I'm not too sure of. There is a lot, I'm not, I, I can never remember, but there are research groups we follow. For example, I was following the robotics and perception, the R RPI from CMU, which is the Robotics and Perception Lab. I was following uh, the professor is Michael Case. I was following his research in you know optimization based SLAM. I was following Yanis Arimono's research. It's a professor I worked with at UMD for a while. He works with uh, autonomous drones. He works in perception. He also runs the Perception and Robotics Group at UMD. I was following a few other professors like that and their research. At the end of the day, instead of keeping track of the trends, it was more about just keeping track of the research we were interested in. So every one of us had their own niche they were keeping track of, which helped all of us. That's great. Yeah, keep track of it on a larger scale. Um, I'll pause right now um, to, to just open it up a little bit and you know, the audience have any questions. I know we went there on a little screen. Um, guys, if you have any questions, please post it in the chat or feel free to just unmute your uh, unmute and ask uh, the question. I'll give you a couple of seconds here. Hi, uh, I had a question. Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, thank you, the Immigrant Project team, for organizing this, and special thank to Ish. Uh, I'm a master's student at the University of Pennsylvania uh, mm -hmm. doing robotics. Mm -hmm. So I have this question, like what's kind of expected from a fresher when you, when you are being interviewed? So like what skills, how much uh, depth they require you to have in research or like what, what, what is something that is the uh, interviewer looking, looking in you? Okay. Um, whenever we interview people who are straight out of graduate school or straight out of undergrad, there is no expectation that you would have years of industry knowledge and you know how to, yeah, you know how to write a, the, the perfect GPU algorithm to optimize feature detection or something. If you have that experience, fantastic. I mean, it'll just, you know, make your case stronger. But in general, we expect them to have a firm understanding of the fundamentals. Do you, if you're applying for a path planning position, do you understand the algorithms you're talking about to the, you know, and detail. Do you understand, uh, do you understand, if you're applying for computer vision, do you understand camera calibration, structure from motion? Uh, do you also understand how geomet projective geometry works and how the image is formed in the camera? Because that's a huge part of it, which gets glossed over in current research. And uh, there is also, so they would expect that. And if you've, you know, worked on any projects, they expect you to know you know, uh, you know everything about it down to why you did, why you chose a certain algorithm or why you decided to go with this specific implementation of it. They would also ask you pointed questions like, oh, in your solution, 
can you come from non-linearities? Can you, uh, uh, how do you make it, how would you optimize it to run on an embedded platform? Stuff like that, they don't really expect an answer. They only want to know if you've thought through it. And honestly, there I would say, if you're able to think through a valid answer, that's fantastic. Even if you're not, if you can walk them through your, uh, if you can walk them through your thought process and express to them why you're thinking this is the right answer, I think if they find your communication skills, you know, um, uh, they fit with the rest of the team, that's still a good answer. Yeah, uh, so just a follow-up thing. So like mm -hmm. how much of programming kind of questions do they ask? So you give a lead code and do they review the kind of coding style or whatever you wrote and question about it or is just the technical rounds after the first round of interview? So a lot of the companies I interviewed with, they had multiple coding rounds. So one would be just standard get past this lead code challenge, which is fine if you've solved lead code challenges. And then after that, they would be more pointed. In one of my interviews, I was asked to write a convolution kernel for an image in C++. And uh, the funny thing was that person asked me to do it on a Google Doc while he was watching me over Skype. Things like that happen. And they were, I don't know how much emphasis they put on syntax when you're not using an IDE or you're not using syntax checks. Personally, I would say if stuff like that bothers them, then I guess you probably don't want to work for them. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's you're trying to gauge how good of a fit you are to right? In some of our coding rounds, we just ask them, you know, can you think through various failure modes? So if I ask you to average out an array, can you think of failure modes like, oh, I'm going to check to see if the array is empty. I'm going to check to see if the pointer I'm pointing to is a null. I'm going to check, uh, I'm going to check, I'm going to check the size of the array so I don't actually overflow some of the buffers I have, that sort of thing. And if you can do that and you can write a function and you understand concepts of inheritance and you understand concepts of, uh, in general, good C++ practices, I think you should be good. Great. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, any more questions? Yeah, I had a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go uh, for Yeah, so this might be a bit of an edge case, uh, but yeah, I, I kind of switched fields by going from aerospace to aerial robotics, where mm -hmm. I work full time. Mm -hmm. But my role is more focused on aer the aerospace aspect. So I want to learn robotics on my own. I've made some progress, but it's really hard to do that, you know, based on online resources. Mm -hmm. uh, found Linux documentation to be sparse and, you know, just there's too many resources, you know, Coursera or Dastrophy. Yeah. So is there any suggestion on what approach to take to learn on your own? That is a tough position to be in. First of all, I feel bad for you. But also, uh, what kind of specific robotics are you aiming for? Are you looking for more controls related roles? Are you looking for something? Uh, uh, it's not really that bad. I tend to focus uh, more on the aerospace aspects of more controls, you know, mm -hmm. the dynamics of the aircraft. So I'm fine. Okay. But it's okay. always interesting to work in the robotic side of things. You know, I, ah. uh, I kind of want to do it out of curiosity, not really out of a need in my job. Okay, fair yeah, enough. So more of like, uh, you know, when I see visual slam, uh, I want to do that for a drone. Uh, using whatever I have in my okay. system, right? So you wanted, to, so if you wanted a visual slam. Oh, sorry, not visual. Let's just go with slam. Yeah. Okay. I, <laughs> the presentation swayed me to say visual. Okay. Okay. Slam is probably better. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm a little biased towards computer vision. That's my area. It's that's the area I work in. But let me try to answer that the best I can. So for control specific resources, I'm sure you know where to look more than I do. But their applications to robotics, I can't think, you're right, Coursera, Udacity, all of them have these huge courses and they also cost a lot of money. But if you are interested, you can actually follow research from professors. I know Vijay Kumar at Grasp Lab and UPenn, uh, I believe there was one person from UPenn here, he can probably attest to that. He does some uh, fancy controls work with robots, uh, with quadcopters. You also have, uh, I believe it's ETH Zurich has some research out on it. But if you want more specific resources, I would also suggest you read up on 
stuff like carbon filtering, particle filters, um, you know, what is why you would use an EKF instead of a carbon filter, how localization works. And since you talked about visual SLAM, SLAM as well, you don't need vision to do SLAM, but a lot of people do it that way. So for that, my recommendation would be to read probabilistic robotics by Sebastian Thrun. You can also find, uh, you can also look at Robot Perception by Michael Case. I've been reading that for a while. It, those guys use factor graphs for optimization. And it's basic, it's not even a vision problem. It's more or less a pose estimation problem. I don't know if that's what you're going for though. Yeah, okay. It's the area. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So uh, Perception for Robots, I think that's the book by Michael Case and I forget the second author's name. And uh, you can also look at probabilistic robotics. That is the one most roboticists get started with when they want to look at stuff like EKFs and, uh, you know, SLAM. Um, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, for, thanks for the question. Yash, before we move into our CV segment, I had one last question for you. Um, many people uh, from those who have registered have um, a sub question, which is, are, are there really a lot of opportunities in the robotics field or mm -hmm. are there not a lot of opportunities, which, which means you're, so many people are competing for very little mm -hmm. opportunity. What are your thoughts on that? Am I to answer pre-COVID or during COVID? Please, please give me the spectrum. Please give me the spectrum. <laughs> so I applied pre-COVID and I never had a, I never ran out of positions to apply to, mm -hmm. but there was always a sense that these positions are not as available as say, you know, software engineer for Amazon or a, a data scientist at some company. Those uh, robotics specific positions were not that available. So I imagine there's stiff competition for them, but you also have to remember not many people actually end up in robotics, or at least that was true in 2018. I don't know anymore. But with COVID, what has happened is people are realizing that humans are kind of a liability. Also, there are a lot of jobs which are just downright demeaning or boring or just physically torturous for humans to do. So companies are now investing in robotics. A lot of companies, my company included, are actually hiring right now. Oh, amazing. Because we're trying to grow our team. So I'm going to shamelessly say, if you guys are interested in a position, go apply on the company website. But uh, given the current situation, I would say I could see a growth in the robotic sector because companies are, they are facing a shortage of manual labor right now. And they see that just waiting COVID out is not a solution. Great point. Really, really great point and, um, you know, super, super encouraging. And I'm sure folks will want to reach out to you on LinkedIn. So I will leave that to the speaker and the attendees to figure out. Uh, with that, um, let's move on into the CV section. We have a couple of minutes here. This will uh, be led by Sulbi. I'll let you take it away. Sure. Thanks, Brahmi. Uh, we have one more question. Do you want to take that or will we volley back to the question? Yeah, let's finish. I can let's take the question. question. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, so the question is, what would be the best time to start applying for spring 2021 graduates? Spring 2021, meaning you finish yeah. in the fall semester right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if there are companies hiring right now, you can apply to them. Generally, they prefer people who can start right away because a lot of these roles are urgent and they don't want to wait till the semester is over. But yeah, it can't hurt to apply right now. We, um, I guess, um, hey, can you, Nagash, Nag, Nagash, yeah, so, uh, I hope so I just I want to say your name right, please. Ask him. <laughs> okay, sure. So I just want to know, like, uh, for job starting in fall 2021, like you graduate ah. in, yeah. Oh. Who graduate in spring. Okay, I see. Yeah. And who start in fall. Yeah. Generally, people I went to graduate school with apply, started applying at the end of their uh, third semester or the start of their fourth semester, meaning that would be around either December or January. And a lot of them had jobs in their hands by the time they graduated. I did not start in April, 
So I got my job in September. Uh, but I, that's also partly because I switched fields and it was more difficult for me. In general, I would say at the at any time in your fourth semester or even third semester is great. If you already had a if you already had a summer internship or a co-op, that makes it a lot easier for you. Awesome, um, Surbi. I guess we can start with the series now. Sure. Let me share my screen. Okay. So we have the first resume from Nikhil Rajkumar More. Is he on the call? Nikhil, are you on the call? You could unmute yourself. Uh, hey, everyone. I am on. Yep. So, yeah, over to you, Yash. Okay. Um, all right. So, looking at the resume, first of all, Nikhil, I would like to ask what kind of position you're looking for? I'm looking to like automotive, electrical, mm -hmm. robotics, maybe, but like not to like. Are you looking for something that has more of a real-time application or are you looking for something that it, that does more of modeling and design, which then gets converted into your uh, solution? Uh, yeah, uh, preferably more uh, modeling. I, see. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you specifically what to do because that is not what I uh, know a lot about, but I can tell you just general things about your CV, which you can probably improve. So objective, I don't, at least at my company, nobody needs. It's, it's obvious that you want a job there, which is why you're applying. So I would take that out, but yeah. Education wise, if you had a good GPA, I would throw that up there too. And then your technical skill set right after that, because people want to look at that. So you list MATLAB Simulink, FMEA, uh, that's the risk assessment thing, if I remember correctly, or the damage assessment method. Okay. Then you have Python, Canvas, AutoCAD, ROS, ISO, uh, I guess that's, the, that's an ISO standard, and then SOLIDWORKS Electrical. Okay. So I imagine you're trying to go for, a, for more of a modeling job profile, which all of these do fit. Some of your experience is pretty good. Uh, Although I would say sensor fusion and lane detection, they don't really add anything to your profile because if you're looking for something that does modeling and control uh, back end, you're not looking for someone who does half transforms or uh, lane detection algorithms. So I would not put that there. Modeling and simulation of hybrid electric vehicles on MATLAB and Simulink. That, uh, I would actually go more in depth there and explain some of what you did, any specific methodologies you used, scripted electric powertrain, battery emission, energy consumption design. Okay, so you uh, basically modeled the characteristics of a battery, if I'm understanding that correctly? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That might also be, that might also use some, so you just say you used MATLAB and ran M scripts, but if you use any specific design methodologies or any way to specifically analyze the battery drain, those would be welcome additions. In general, also, okay, so now, so I would move the technical skill set under your education and your work experience in your academic projects. And you have airspace experience technologies. Uh, that looks pretty good to me. I imagine that's what someone who is in a modeling role requires. You need to be able to make bill of materials after you finalize your design. You need to be able to validate your design. So I assume that's also part of what you did there. Uh, your work experience looks good to me, but again, I can't comment on it too much because that is not my field. More helpful. Okay, yeah. I'm glad you think it's helpful. So we have the next resume from Chayan. Are you on the call? I think you are, right? Yes. If you can see. Yep. 
Can you see his resume? I can see it, but only half of it. Okay. Now I can see the rest. Okay. Um, you're zooming in. Okay, fine. This is fine. So again, here I would remove the summary, I guess. Then Master of Engineering in Robotics, relevant coursework. So I would not add any introduction courses to your relevant coursework. I imagine you're applying to a job because you are good at something. So introduction to machine learning doesn't help your case, but classical and deep learning approaches of geometry computer vision, which I'm assuming is Yanis's course. Maybe yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, that is a good one. So you should keep that there. I would also move your skills above relevant coursework. And uh, I would talk a little bit more about, let's see, technologies, OpenCV, TensorFlow, SciPy, the next. So, so CNN, I get why you would put it in technology, but it's more conceptual than that. And stuff like computer vision, CNN, image processing, deep learning, that is apparent from the stuff you've done and what you're presenting and the position you've applied for. So I don't think you need to put it in technologies. So as far as projects go, I recognize all of these projects because they are from the classes I took. So you might want to talk a little bit more about what you did differently in them because otherwise they are going to look the same as everyone else who you know, came from UMD and took the same classes as you. You also should probably put in any research experience you have. If you work for a lab, you should. And what I see here is if you're saying you did a project on structure from motion, you're basically telling the reviewer what structure from motion is, but they already know you're constructing a 3D scene from a monocular camera uh, using traditional deep learning approaches. It would be handier to go into stuff like what did you develop with it with if it's C plus plus all you know even better, uh, what kind of performance you got out of it, were there any specific techniques you used to reduce nonlinearities or improve performance, that sort of thing, even you know auto calibration. I see you implemented the camera calibration technique using a robust technique. I don't know what that robust the robust technique is, so a little more. Uh, so you say you used homography, intrinsic and extrinsic parameters were found and optimization was done using these squares. This is apparent to anyone who's read you know, multiple view geometry. So you should probably specify what kind of nonlinear optimization did you use? Why did you use it? Um, keep it as concise as possible. If you developed in C++, what kind of performance you got out of it? Those would be handy to have here because then they make it stand out from all of the class projects that would actually end up on the interviewer's table. And I would also probably reduce the number of uh, projects, maybe prune them and aim them towards a specific position you're applying for. For example, if it's a localization mapping one, of course you want to keep structure from motion, but uh, you don't necessarily want traffic sign recognition, uh, recognition. If it's for deep learning, then you want to keep the deep learning projects instead and maybe mention one or two of the classical approaches just so you show that you understand them. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. We have a uh, socket. Hi, socket. Are you on the call? Uh, hi. Yeah, I am. Okay. Another UMCP resume. All right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, see what I was saying about the projects that listed in the same order too. It's, <laughs> I don't mean to point you out or anything. I'm just saying it'd be very apparent to someone who looks into it. We are roommates. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> also, so I would do away with the summary. I, okay, relevant coursework. And it looks pretty similar to the one I just saw, <laughs> except for the experience. So you should probably capitalize on that. You work for the you work for MRC, worked on design and development of a textless robotic hand research for various courses. So what kind of robot hand was this? Was this the shadow hand with the 
uh, tactile sensors on the fingertips, used for yeah. multi track cameras to obtain intricate finger joint angles. I would say instead of talking about and men, uh, you're talking so much about the technology that went into it, you can maybe mention it in one line and then talk more about what kind of deep learning methods did you, uh, you know, use there, what kind of results you got out of it. <laughs> Excuse me. For more accurate pose estimation using minimum number of fiducial markers. Again, engineers in gen general hate adjectives. Numbers are always good. So when you say minimum number of fiducial markers, what is that? Is that five? Is that 50? It's hard for me to gauge. So you also have the NASA Swarmathon competition where you use C++ and ROS for multi-foraging, obstacle avoidance, maximum coverage planning. What algorithms did you use there? Um, did you, what sort of multi-robot planning do you use? Do you use probabilistic methods? Uh, what, those sort of things would be very handy here. And again, the advice I gave for the previous series still stands here because it looks pretty much the same. Okay. All right. Um, that is all I have to say. We have like around six minutes more. Mm -hmm. so, or do you guys want to uh, throw more questions at Yash or what do you guys want to do? An open uh, floor at this point. So we maybe we can pull up some CVs if uh, there are no questions, uh, because there are some. Are the people who sent the CVs on this call? I think Lila, Lila and somebody else. Um, Aditya, right? Aditya says, "Hey, I think I had sent my resume as well for review. Uh, can we please pull out Aditya's?" TV. And then I, I think we can close it with that. Okay. Give me one minute. Guys, okay, so while, Sur while Surbi is pulling that up, you know, we have last five minutes before this call ends for you to ask any questions that you might want to Yash. So this is this is your best opportunity. Uh, you know, if there are any very quick questions that you want to just ask right now. Okay. Can you see my screen? I can. Could you zoom out a little so I can see more of it? Is that good? Uh, yeah, that should work. All right. Aditya Narayan Das. No objective. That's a good start. CMU, computational design and manufacturing. C, Python. That don't work. Okay. Um, skills look good. Experience would be research intern, integrated design innovation group, CMU. Automated shape grammar development for. Uh, it's finally image classification. Okay. Stereo vision based perception system for tracking localization for architectural products and uh, product, uh, construction environment. I think this is pretty good experience you have there. And uh, I would devote more uh, page um, area to that than your projects. Okay. And uh, I would talk a bit more about what sort of uh, stereo vision system you were actually, uh, what features you were extracting from architectural products, maybe a, few, a bit more detail, but this looks pretty good. Right. Pro uh, projects wise, ray tracing engine. You, uh, well, if you wrote one from scratch, it shows that you understand, uh, you understand linear algebra, computer graphics, you understand perspective transforms. So, you also say it's in Python, you have a link to your code. I actually like that. Anyone viewing it on PDF can click to see what you did and see how you did it. So I think that's also a nice touch. Dynamic storage allocator. So this I'm confused about. When you say you implemented malloc, calloc, realloc, and free from the standard C library, yeah. uh, 
you basically implement re-implemented them for yourself or did you use the same ones uh no no i i re-implemented them i see and then you achieved a specific perform okay 10,500 kilo ops by implementing a segregated double event to the status structure for free memory traversal. This shows that you understand computer architecture, how to manipulate low level memory, and you also show results. So I think that's also excellent. You also have your code there, stereo reconstruction in Python. So you're saying you implemented two V, a two view of 3D reconstruction, calculated image to image seen to image correspondences by assuming fundamental and essential. Uh, this is what I was talking about. So the fact that you talk about fundamental and essential matrices, which shows that you implemented the algorithm, you know you implemented in Python, your code, the link to your code is there to go and see what it's about. You also wrote your own triangulation and stereo matching algorithms to, to obtain 3D coordinates from 2D point correspondences. Okay, I think that is great so far. I would act, so again, this might be a bit of a nitpick, but I would like, I would say, emphasize more on your experience because that seems a lot more interesting, but your projects are pretty interesting too. And right. uh, they show that you understand vision and you understand low level computer architecture and how to manipulate that. So I think that's great. Right. And you have publications uh, as well. So I just had one question mm -hmm. here. So basically my undergrad was in mechanical engineering and mm -hmm. my publications are from like finite element methods and stuff like that. Sure. So I'm not sure if I should include that on my resume. Yeah, I mean, I think they have some uh, solid transferable skills, but then again, I'm not sure if I should, uh, yeah, how to, if I should include them or I should maybe remove them and give more space to something else. I see. I have two trains of thought on that. One being that you have publications. Uh, you should probably mention the journal they were published in. So what that indicates is you can look at a research problem, write a paper about it. You, you can you can basically you understand the approach to research and solving the original question, which is always great. Right. But if you have more interesting and more impressive projects which showcase what you want to do, uh, I would say they take precedence right. over this. Absolutely. But, yeah, but in general, this looks like a pretty good CV to me. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I think we have one more question, which uh, I'm going to take, uh, which is uh, from Pranoy. Pranoy, if you're on the call. Uh, so he says, hey, I'm Pranoy and I am joining my master's of engineering in robotics this fall. My goal is to get into the field of uh, space manufacturing. Please advise on how to proceed. Hmm. Okay. Are you a citizen, Pranoy? Uh, no. Okay. I think, the f so I'll be honest, space manufacturing or space robotics is not my field. There are a host of problems associated with it. Like for example, how do you thermal dissipation if there's no atmosphere? which I don't know how to deal with. Uh, but I would say, you sh to me, the most important thing is because of your citizenship status, what kind of companies can you work for? I don't think you can directly go work for NASA. Uh, I don't know if you can work for a contractor that works for NASA. I don't really know, but that would be the most important question I would figure out. Mm, okay, sure. Um so, so is there anything else I can do in the coursework or the projects I take, so which can guide me to that uh, goal? Can you tell me a bit more about what you want to do with space manufacturing? So, uh, basically, want to specialize in air two manufacturing in uh, space manufacturing. So, okay. so basically, I I do think uh, all this is going into a research kind of thing. So, where I want to be. Because there, there are no particular products on this kind of stuff. So I want to be in the research of this. Okay. Or do you have labs in mind you can work for? No, I don't have any idea. Okay. That would be the first place to start. I know CMU has some space research. Um, I know UMD does some additive manufacturing research. I don't know if there's an overlap between space and that. I know mm -hmm. CU Boulder does some space uh, robots research. You could look into that. 
Apart from that, I don't think I have much else to tell you because this is uh, not my field and I don't really know much about it. Okay. Cool. I think that was, we are slightly over time, but um, I think that is, um, yeah, we just have one more question. We can take one last question from Laila. What about if you want to transition from full stack web engineer into the field of robotics? Matt, <laughs> let me explain that a bit more. So I am at, so it depends on the kind of profile you want again. Uh, Lila, was it? Yeah. Depends on the kind of field and the kind of job profile you're looking for. So I imagine as a full stack engineer, you don't do a lot of math in your work. Again, I could be wrong because I'm not a full stack engineer, but a lot of robotics comes down. You would do well to read some research papers, read some of the textbooks I mentioned, and uh, you should, and if you can do some low level programming, like C++ or C would be a great place to start. And if you can demonstrate skills there, you can, a lot of times robotics teams, they just need someone who can do excellent C++. So a lot of times the, the solution doesn't need someone who can implement the best, plan, the most optimal planning algorithm. They just need someone who can write a multi-threaded, multi-inheritance class. Uh, if you can do that, I'm sure there's a place for you on a robotics team somewhere. Awesome. I, Does that I, answer your question? I think yeah, she says thank you very much. Okay. So that was, that's it guys. Um, thank you so much Yash for um, agreeing to be our speaker and dedicating yeah. your time uh, in preparing all of this. And thank you everybody for who uh, found that, found this useful. And we will have a, a feedback uh, survey, which would be coming shortly after the session. Please Actually it's out already. It's already, already out, so. yeah. So uh, we, we really appreciate feedback, uh, good or bad. Uh, so we always are improving. We have a lineup of speakers coming up from different fields. And uh, do uh, watch out our LinkedIn page for uh, upcoming events. We also have a website launching soon in the coming month. So a lot of stuff um, coming up with the immigrant project. So stay tuned. Thank you, Yash, and thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining.